get, we're almost there. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Mr. Yeager, the floor is yours. Thanks, Heather. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brooks Yeager with uh, Birdwell Strategies, which is a long-winded way of saying I work for myself. You know, the problem with working for yourself is that your boss is usually a mean SOB and your only employee is a lazy, shiftless. Uh, but uh, other than that, it's a, it, it conveys a nice degree of freedom and I can recommend it. You get to do fun projects like uh, moderating panels at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And I'm very appreciative of Heather and the Center for asking me to moderate this panel because I think it'll be somewhat unique. Uh, we often find ourselves when we talk about um, matters of the Arctic talking about geopolitics or the management of natural resources, but it's important for us to remember that the Arctic is a living natural system whose components are extremely important, vital in fact, to the food security of many human beings who live in the Arctic and quite a few who live outside the Arctic. Um, and certainly uh, the marine system is a matter of some intimacy for people who live locally along the coasts of the Arctic, whether they're indigenous or more recently arrived. And so its management has a special delicacy about it, shall we say, and a special importance and so I'm very glad that this panel is uh, convened to talk about that aspect of the future of the Arctic. Um, I want to thank Lawson Brigham for introducing a concept which I think is extremely important in terms of management of the future of the Arctic and certainly management of the future of something we would call fisheries in the Arctic, and that is the concept of uncertainty. Um, if you think that it's hard to predict how many transcontinental voyages will take place in 2025 in the Arctic, imagine the difficulty of predicting whether or not there will be commercial fisheries on fish stocks that currently don't exist in the Arctic, but might move there under the influence of climate change and thermal gradients in the ocean. Uh, and uh, our panelists, uh, if I can feel, excuse me for using a fisheries metaphor, CSIS has kindly stocked our panel with experts in the matter of fisheries management. Uh, some people who've spent a great deal of time thinking about these uncertainties and a, a potential transition to the need to manage fisheries in the Arctic, which has never been a pressing need before now, since there were no commercial fisheries in the central Arctic, in the ice-covered Arctic, although there have been very important fisheries on the perimeter of the Arctic in places like the Barents Sea and the Bering Sea, but none really in the area that we commonly identify as the central Arctic. So, as I say, we do have some experts here um, in, in this area. Um, the, our first speaker, Scott Heileman, has been uh, directing for a number of years uh, an effort on behalf of the Pew Charitable Trusts uh, to uh, practice, uh, shall we say, uh, some precaution with regard to the transition to fisheries in the Arctic, and I think he will explain that to you in a presentation. And I think the, our other two panelists have also been involved in government to government and other discussions of the future of fisheries management. I know that uh, Ambassador David Bolton, my a longtime friend and wonderful resource of the State Department has led a number of intergovernmental discussions about how to manage the potential transition to a 
future in the Arctic in which commercial fisheries are at least a possibility. And uh, I think we'd be glad to talk about that. I, on the other hand, would like to push this discussion to be about a slightly broader horizon than just fisheries management because what's at stake really uh, is the management of the entire marine system of the Arctic, which is a common resource that is shared among all the Arctic coastal states and to some extent could be shared by nations with distant water fishing fleets and others. But uh, proper management will be important to make sure that as this resource is assessed and considered and exploited, if it ever is, that uh, its benefits continue to be available to citizens and local uh, inhabitants of the Arctic who are so critically dependent on it, uh, as well as that it not go the way of many fisheries that we have seen in the past that were perhaps not as well managed as we might have liked, but and are now suffering from the results of our exploitation. So, I'd like to give the floor first to Scott Heileman um, to start the discussion. Uh, and uh, I think it would be, uh, I think this is an audience that will be very interested in some of the problems that, and uncertainties that we have to deal with in this area and also in what kinds of positive cooperation efforts might be available among the Arctic nations to make sure that this resource uh, over time is well managed. So Scott, please go ahead. Thank you, Brooks, and uh, thanks uh, CSIS for organizing this and Heather Conley for inviting me. And um, I also want to congratulate CSIS on its advanced technology. You're probably in the, when I was sitting in the audience watching the previous panels, I was wondering what was showing on the screen in front of me. Now that I'm up here, I can tell you that it's live streaming the Nigeria-France game in the World <laughs> Cup. Um, so if you see something across my face, it's, uh, imagine me saying, goal! Okay. Uh, but seriously, I'll jump right in, in the interest of time. Um, I want to talk today about preventing a problem before it starts and closing a gap in the international legal framework for the Arctic. And note that uh, the conference today is about Arctic cooperation, so here's a nice uh, textbook case of a, of a place where we can all cooperate together. Um, I'm going to do this through a series of maps. Um, the area that I'm going to talk about today is uh, the Central Arctic Ocean. It's the area within those red lines formed by the EEZs of the five Arctic coastal countries. It's about the size of the Mediterranean Ocean. It's quite large, 2.8 million square kilometers. A um, couple things to note right off the bat. For the purposes of fisheries discussions, the um, uh, discussions about uh, the extended continental shelves are not that important. Um, so that's the boundary that uh, applies to international fisheries, regardless of how uh, the extended continental shelves are um, eventually extended. Um, and in this area, essentially, unregulated commercial fishing is permissible unless countries agree to get together and draw rules about them. Um, we've, uh, you always hear a lot about Arctic melting, but it's important to actually look at it. Um, Essentially, the last seven years are the top seven years of melting in the uh, satellite record. The melting occurs in a very uneven fashion. So, uh, as a previous speaker mentioned, um, you know, don't be fooled when, and here's the example, 2012 was a record year um, for the, uh, the shrinking, the, the small extent of ice in September at the low point of, of um, the Arctic ice pack. Uh, 20, 000, 2013, bounced back, but the yellow trend line really shows the story. Another way to look at the, that previous map was talking about ice cover. This is talking about ice thickness, which is another way of looking at um, how much, quote unquote, permanent ice there is left. And um, you can see that if you drew a trend line there, uh, it would be um, pretty significant and pronounced. Um, so let's look at the baseline. The, this, is a map, this map shows um, what we used to call perennial ice or permanent ice, um, the median ice cover in September from 1979 to 2000. So essentially in kind of modern human history, modern satellite record, this is sort of what 
most of us uh, grew up thinking about. Uh, and I'd say to a large extent, many of our policies are still based on this idea that in September, at the low point of ice in the Arctic, there's a heck of a lot of ice. And so if you superimpose the uh, EEZs of the five countries on there, you can see why this um, Central Arctic Ocean area was a theoretical construct for human beings. Up until very recently, there were a handful of lawyers who actually understood where it was and worried, thought about it a little bit, but it was a very abstract concept for everyone else because it was permanently frozen. Uh, this is 20, uh, 2012, and as I showed in the previous uh, slide, this was the record year, tw uh, the breaking the record in 2007. And uh, so the point here is, uh, and this is September, so this is the low point again, uh, is you're seeing a lot of open water uh, in, uh, in the summer, at the end of the summer, and also that it's occurring, it's not occurring in some uniform fashion all around the boundaries of those countries, it's actually occurring in very specific ways that have geographic and political consequences. Mostly, primarily, uh, the biggest areas between the U.S. and Russia there and the, above the, in the Chukchi Sea, and then quite a bit along the uh, Russian boundary. And uh, essentially, we're really looking at the birth of a new ocean here that requires us to think about um, how to regulate parts of it. Uh, truth in advertising, this is two 2013, which as I said was not, a, it's, in the, it's in the top seven, but it's not in the record. And you can see that um, there's less melting along this line, but it still persists in the uh, Chukchi above US and Russia, above the Bering Strait, and quite a bit along the Russian EEZ. And this is, this is again looking at, um, just for fun, we looked at uh, percentage of the uh, the maritime boundary, where Russia's maritime boundary abuts the Central Arctic Ocean, and, and asked the question, what percentage of that boundary line was open water in September? So you can see in 2013 it was 30 percent, um, which uh, compared to 2012 doesn't seem like all that much, which was over 70 percent, but 30 percent is still actually very significant, and you can see how the trend line works. So essentially, it's worth working on this issue. It's worth thinking about how to deal with this. What do we know about this area that's emerging in the Central Arctic Ocean? Um, we know that uh, parts of it are of fishable depths made up of the continental shelf on the Chukchi Plateau or uh, continental ridges. Um, we know that um, essentially in 2012, the year that I mentioned was the record, essentially an area the size of the Baltic Sea was fishable depth. So when I say it's a new ocean emerging, that's what I mean. We also know that there's straddling stocks of Arctic cod that marine mammals rely on, and that these area, this is right on the edges of areas that Arctic indigenous people in Alaska and Canada depend on for subsistence. We also know that it's geographically accessible in the modern world of high seas fisheries. There really aren't very many inaccessible parts of the ocean. It's less a distance to go to places where fisheries are taking place in the Antarctic for many countries than it is to just um, go up the Bering Strait. And the most likely fishery would be uh, an Arctic cod fishery, I believe. Uh, we have examples of, um, I'm gonna go very quickly on this, we have examples uh, of area, there are many examples actually of areas where unregulated fishing has caused ecological and economic problems when fishermen get, a, when the fishing industry gets ahead of rule, rule making. Um, this is an example that was uh, important for the U.S. and Russia. They eventually resolved it, but only after the Pollock stock in this area of the central Bering Sea was overfished. And today there's no fishing in this area because those stocks haven't recovered. So this is a very real potential problem that we should be paying attention to. Um, again, I'll go quickly through here. These remote, these remote Arctic waters are far from barren. There's lots more to learn about them, but essentially the same um, the same food web that occurs in waters closer to shore also takes place there. Arctic cod are the most abundant fish in this marine food web. They're the keystone species that transfer energy up and down the, the food web. And um, a fishery targeting Arctic cod could uh, severely affect the carrying capacity of the region well before we even know what that carrying capacity is. Uh, 
on this issue, we've spent some time uh, trying to compile uh, information, previously existing information, um, about this region. And um, as the science panel noted, there's, there's a fair amount of activity. It tends to be scattered and siloed, and it's hard to pull together. And we've made a couple modest attempts. This is pulling together some zooplankton information, just to make the obvious point that um, there is life here. Zooplankton is the basis of uh, the whole Arctic ecosystem. And then um, this is polar bear and ring seal data from uh, Russian colleagues. Again, we've been um, sponsoring some workshops and doing some uh, scouting around to compile existing data. And Olga Romanenko, who's in the audience here on my staff, has spent a fair amount of time in Russia um, talking with Russian colleagues and scientists and hosting workshops to sort of pull together some of this information. So what's the solution? I've, uh, I've outlined uh, a potential problem. What's the solution? Uh, to summarize, I believe the best approach is for Arctic coastal countries to take the lead in figuring out a simple international agreement to maintain the status quo of what's happening there right now. Prevent industrial fishing from starting unless and until science and management tools are put in place to ensure sustainability and to facilitate joint research. Uh, this is a very conventional approach under uh, UN Law of the Sea Treaty for dealing with commercial fisheries in international waters. But the point is, none of this happens automatically on the high seas. You have to get together and draw these rules up and figure out what you want to do. And unless nations act soon, the rapid melting of this ice means that this Central Arctic Ocean is going to be increasingly accessible to unregulated industrial fishing in the next few years. And we have many experiences of what that means, and none of it is good anywhere in the ocean where this is taking place ahead of rules. It just hasn't been a pretty picture. Um, over 2,000 scientists uh, from around the world, including about two-thirds from Arctic countries, sent a letter a few years ago to Arctic countries asking them to take the lead and um, actually and following this exact approach. So it's, it's not exactly a radical idea. And uh, there's growing political momentum towards uh, such an agreement. Uh, Andre and David Bolton can talk about this in more detail, but essentially, uh, since 2008, the Arctic coastal countries individually have been factor figuring out uh, the policy that they would like to implement around this area issue, and countries have, uh, like Canada, Greenland, and Greenland, Denmark, and the United States have factored it into their policies. Um, and more recently, uh, and uh, Russian has Russia has been very active at the uh, experts level discussing this, and we've had some great. Um, great discussions with colleagues there about this approach. And most recently, which David Bolton can speak to more authoritatively, uh, the, um, the five Arctic coastal countries met in Nuuk in Greenland in March and actually um, uh, developed a consensus that the approach that I've talked about is what's needed and are trying to figure out how to iron out all the details on that. Oh, actually, I got ahead of my slide. There's a photo of the folks meeting in Greenland, and online you can read a chairman's statement and a press release, which um, um, the press release even used in the title the word consensus. So I found this to be uh, really a terrific progress. I was able to go as part of that meeting. It was, I'm an amateur when it comes to diplomacy, so it was very fun to sit in a room and watch the professionals do it. And I, um, just want to give a shout out to David Bolton, who has chaired that session and previous sessions. It was really impressive to see, um, to see diplomacy in action and uh, countries sitting down and talking about their differences and figuring out a common approach. And, and it, was, uh, was quite, uh, it was quite interesting to watch. Um, and I think I'll end there. Um, the maps that I've showed today are available in various booklets that Olga has over there if you ask her for them, and they're also available online. Thanks very much for inviting me. Okay, thank you, Scott. Andre, could I ask you to follow up and uh, tell us a little bit about how, the, how you see these issues from the Russian side and also about the progress that uh, Scott says is being made, so. Uh, thank you. I'm not going to show many slides. Uh, let me uh, pick up from 
where Marlene ended uh, the session saying fisheries is very traditional for the Arctic. Uh, not everywhere in the Arctic. Uh, that's the point, and this is an issue which Scott was addressing. So I was specifically picking up different maps uh, because I expected Scott to show the ones uh, he did. So this is, this is the current uh, state of ice extent in the Arctic yesterday, June 24. Uh, which is, of course, much larger than it is in September. So September is, uh, usually people show the September maps. Uh, September is uh, the uh, minimum extent. Uh, Mid-March is uh, usually the maximum extent. And we are now in the, in the early stages or somewhat mature st stages of melting or receding ice in the Arctic. It's pretty extensive here, also with, uh, with a large portion of the uh, thick uh, ice there. Th this is the reason why uh, fishing is traditional only in few parts, very, very few parts in the Arctic. In the western parts, which is basically Barents Sea and Norwegian Sea, Greenland Sea, and the Bering Sea, although Bering Sea does not fall under the definition of the Arctic in the Russian definition uh, of the region. Most parts of the Arctic are not traditional fishery grounds, and that's exactly the issue uh, which uh, Scott was addressing. Uh, this is exactly the reason why there is no regulation of fishing uh, in the central part uh, of the Arctic Sea, beyond the 200 uh, nautic miles uh, jurisdictions of the coastal states. Uh, just let me briefly stop at uh, pointing out that the central basin is definitely not the single issue of fish, uh, fisheries in the area. Uh, from the Russian perspective, uh, bilateral cooperation is very important. Uh, both Norway and the U.S. are very important partners for Russia on the fisheries uh, issues. Norway uh, stands for uh, something like two-thirds of Russian catch, uh, or cooperation with Norway stands for about two-thirds of Russian catch without the Bering Sea. And the Bering Sea cooperation is crucial for the fisheries in the Far East, in the, in the Pacific part for Russia. Uh, also, Faroe Islands are important, although this is outside the Arctic uh, directly. Uh, Greenland is an important partner, but less important, uh, like uh, Iceland is. So Norway and the U.S. are very important for Russian fisheries in general, uh, because this is, this is a large portion of, of the total Russian catch in different seas. So the issue at stake is, uh, is uh, uh, also the central, uh, central part of the uh, uh, Arctic Ocean. And let me come back to the historic picture. This is, uh, I was picking up three uh, years for June, uh, period of time. So this is the uh, year of 2012, the year of a minimum extent so far. We may beat this record this year, we don't know it yet exactly, but the receding uh, pace is pretty, pretty, pretty uh, high. Uh, what is important for me, so this is the images made by the Russian Arctic and Antarctic, uh, Antarctic Research Institute. It mainly covers the Russian part of the Arctic uh, with the perspective, perspective from uh, Russia. What is important for me in this, uh, in this uh, picture is that whether 2012, the minimal uh, ice extent, or 2013, the most recent maximum of ice extent, or this year in June, which is not, not the best season uh, in the Arctic, we see this blue part uh, at the entry or exit of the Bering Strait. Uh, this is exactly, so I go back again. This is 2012, 2013, and this year. This is exactly the area which, uh, which Scott was pointing to, which leads you to the Chukchi Plateau, one of the potential fishing grounds. Uh, of course, we all realize uh, we all realize there has been no commercial fishing there so far. So the basic idea is what if it happens, and there are several issues involved in the issue. So I probably here need to emphasize that I don't speak for my government. I, I present here a different view, which deviates to some extent at least uh, from that of my government. But we did a pretty, pretty intensive research uh, on the issue. Uh, I was myself uh, getting interested in the issue from 2010 uh, when we, uh, within our group, first discovered uh, the issue as the important one. And probably the most intensive uh, uh, summary of the discussions we have had over the past years on that issue are, is included in the 2013 uh, report uh, by the Russian International Affairs 
uh, Council, which comes up with a very, very clear, straightforward recommendation. Uh, we need to address the issue, and we shall, not, we shall have an agreement uh, on the central basin of the, of the Arctic Ocean without delay. And I will explain to you why we have a problem, what, what are the problems as seen from the government, and why we believe uh, we need to proceed. So what is the issue about? <coughs> Again, as Scott was showing, uh, there is an area beyond the um, uh, fisheries jurisdictions of coastal states. And it is particularly important to note that uh, there are very few places in the global ocean which are not covered by uh, any uh, regional fisheries management agreement or organization. There are very, very few areas worldwide, and this is one of the few areas which are remaining unregulated. There are three more, and I think Scott was showing them as well, one in the, in the, in the middle Bering Sea, one in the Barents Sea, and one uh, in the Norwegian Sea. Uh, so it's basically an issue which has remained unregulated for a simple reason that there was no commercial fishing due to the ice conditions, and due to the uh, movement uh, of fish into that area. We do register, however, that fish is, starts migrating north and east in the summer season, in the Arctic summer season, and there is an expectation, uh, expectation that fish is likely to be available uh, for fishing uh, in that area uh, sometime from now. The Russian fisheries industries are uh, very much favoring such an agreement. Many people in the academic community, including experts on the issue or lawyers, do support this idea. And we have numerous publications uh, on these issues, but there is no, uh, no uh, eagerness on the side of the Russian government to rush with the agreement. This is not to say that the Russian government would say no, no interest. It is engaged in consultations, but it does not rush towards concluding uh, the work. And uh, I was, was exchanging many different arguments. I was collecting them in my research and uh, I found out two of them being most important for the Russian discussions. Uh, number one argument, which is very formal, is to say uh, there is no commercial fishing uh, going to be possible anytime soon, so there is no, no rush to have an agreement. Okay, if there is no rush now, uh, but basically there is uh, a reasonable ground to believe it might be important, why not including it now? And the second argument, which is more important in the Russian debate, is who is going to sign the agreement? Is it about the coastal states, the five, or is it about non-Arctic countries as well? And this is ex hitting exactly the most difficult part of the Russian debate about non-Arctic states of get being involved in Arctic issues, uh, which is a progressing process, but uh, which, of course, uh, causes much of the hesitance. Uh, and, uh, let me focus on, on the uh, issues which are, what, what the stakes here are. Well, first of all, there is often a confusion uh, in discussions about a proposed agreement, uh, and uh, this confusion is very much widespread in Russia, when people believe that what is proposed is to establish uh, another regional fisheries management organization or arrangement, which would be, uh, like NEAFC, an organization which collects scientific data about fish, which makes forecasts for the development of the stock, which de de defines for every year how much of what fish can be caught, and then uh, the quotas uh, for, for catch are distributed among the economic zones, and then the quotas for outside the economic zones are being established and sp spread within the organization. Uh, this is not something which is, uh, for the time being, uh, considered. Uh, the proposal which is on the table basically suggests that we agree that no one is going to fish here until we decide we need a, a, a regional organization. Mm -hmm. uh, and unless we agree on uh, cooperation uh, in terms of scientific research of the biological resources, of the area, and on the basis of that research, we would at some point in time come, uh, probably come, probably not, uh, come to the conclusion that uh, commercial fisheries are available. So it's not about establishing an organization or agreement. Uh, this is to say uh, no commercial fishing until we have agreed 
on the rules uh, of fishing in that uh, area. This is something which is uh, absolutely clearly uh, understood by the Russian fisheries industries as being uh, in their uh, interest. Secondly, when we talk about saying uh, that no commercial fishing shall be available uh, beyond the 200 uh, uh, miles economic zones, uh, this is definitely not about coastal states. Uh, because coastal states are not going to fish uh, in, in that area anyway, uh, even, even uh, if at some time commercial fisheries may be available uh, in that area. Coastal states basically primarily fish within their economic zones. In a few cases, they may extend uh, the fishing grounds, but basically their area is, is within the 200 uh, miles zones. And usually, especially for the straddling stock, uh, coastal states are not interested that third countries fish outside uh, their fishery jurisdictions. So this is about establishing rules not for the coastal states. This is about establishing rules for non-coastal states, if we want such an agreement. <coughs> uh, thirdly, this is not basically about every third country state, uh, which eventually could uh, start fishing here. Uh, because anyway, uh, if you go to the European Union or Norway, which is not member of the European Union, both uh, prohibit uh, fishing in the areas not covered by regional organizations. So we can basically assume that neither Norway nor European Union would issue licenses for fishing in that area as long as there is no uh, regional organization here. So this is about third countries which are not in the European Union or, or which, are, which are not Norway. This is about uh, other countries, and this is exactly because potential fishing grounds are close to the Bering Strait. This is about countries like China, uh, Japan, uh, South Korea, and probably a few more uh, countries which are engaged in expeditionary uh, fisheries far from their shores. So the point is, <coughs> and this is a dilemma uh, in the Russian uh, debate, because people would say, okay, we." W would not like to engage third countries in, in that arrangement. If this were an arrangement of five coastal states, excluding others, uh, but preventing others from uh, fishing, that would be fine. But this is something which doesn't work. Because uh, under the 1995 agreement, uh, you at least must inform others who might be interested uh, in fishing that you are going to establish something here. If you don't, if, you have not, if they have not been involved at the early stages of developing a regime, uh, they are free to fish there. They have not been bound. Uh, so that's why, the, uh, and this is, as I understand, and Ambassador Bolton may tell us a few words about this, this is part of the debates uh, uh, whether and when uh, non-Arctic states may be engaged in these sort of consultations uh, and of the agreement, which is, which is not a consensual issue yet. Uh, within the uh, consultation of uh, five states. But basically, uh, uh, the hesitance on the Russian side, on the Russian government side, is clear to me because it's a general hesitance of getting non-Arctic states involved for regime issues. At the same time, uh, uh, there is no way of preventing them from fishing in that area except for engaging them in a regime. And again, uh, the problem here would be uh, not engaging uh, third countries, uh, but the problem would be, or would, or probably other problems might be of a different sort. For me, if I, was in, if I were interested in fishing uh, eventually in this region, I would be most interested in joining the regime, but also establishing the rules on uh, how I decide that it is much mature for fishing. Mm -hmm. Because I would be afraid that others who are cons more conservative on the issues and more on the conservation side uh, for the biological resources, I would be concerned that at the point when I want to start commercial fishing there, I may be bound by the agreement, which would not allow me to begin it uh, without consent of other more conservative parties. So the basic trick here, and we are not yet over that barrier within the Russian debate, is, is not about whether or not we need a regional organization. This is not the point. But whether or not we are prepared to accept a solution which would prevent non-Arctic states from fishing by engaging them, engaging them in an agreement, in a, an arrangement uh, on uh, fisheries, uh, regulated fisheries in the central basin. Uh, we will see how things evolve. I believe that uh, uh, 
So we do have intensive discussions in professional circles on that issue, but uh, definitely the political climate now is not most conducive for advancing uh, on that part. And uh, I would not exclude if we want to make things uh, work in the Arctic as part of the uh, both bilateral US-Russian uh, cooperation or wider cooperation, this uh, could be uh, an issue which, uh, which uh, would be sort of an e a low hanging fruit uh, yeah. to pick up uh, and, and with which we could go ahead, but not today, probably not tomorrow, we'll see when. But I hope uh, the American chairmanship will help to move ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Appreciate your um, comments on the issue, which now sounds a bit uh, that it has some complexity to it. Uh, um, maybe not so simple as it seemed, and yet uh, there seems to be some agreement that, in principle, the idea of exercising precaution in this area is, a, is the right approach, but uh, exactly how you exercise it in a international law context might present some issues. Is that, uh, David, would you like to comment on that a little bit? Yes, uh, thank you, Brooks. I'd actually like to talk about two things, both briefly. One is to lend my perspective to the topic that both uh, Scott and Andre were discussing now, the Arctic Fisheries Initiative, the effort to prevent unregulated high seas fishing from starting in the um, Central Arctic Ocean. But I also, Brooks, want to take up uh, a thought you had at the, up, the start of the panel to talk about perhaps some broader issues about the Arctic Ocean that might be pursued either through the Arctic Council or otherwise. Um, I don't know who's controlling the slides, but it'd be great to have one of uh, Scott's pictures that shows the 200-mile uh, line in the Central Arctic Ocean, just up while I talk about that. Is that possible? No. Yeah, that's fine, thanks. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't see Scott's slides. No. <laughs> okay. I'm afraid what's going to come up. Now. Yeah, he's <laughs> probably coming here. Yeah. Talk about Svalbard. Yes. There you go. <laughs> One of those. Yeah, that's, that's good. Uh, good. Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. There you go. That's fine. Stop right there. Okay. <laughs> Line from a great song. Um, Heather Conley asked the question of David Hayes in the last panel, what happens you know, to try to deal with friction between the state of Alaska and the federal government? On this issue, there is virtual unanimity of perspective from all of the important US constituent groups who have looked at it. The state of Alaska, the Arctic, uh, rather the Alaska-based fishing industry, the Alaska native community, the US environmental community, Congress, the administration, all think we ought to be doing what we're trying to do here, namely to prevent unregulated fishing from starting up in that striped area. Indeed, the United States has already done essentially that in the area of our exclusive economic zone just below that red line north of Alaska. We have prohibited commercial fishing from starting up there through a decision of the North Pacific Fishery Management Council written into law by the Secretary of Commerce. Uh, why? Because we didn't have enough information on which to base proper fisheries management. We want to sort of take that same idea and apply it to the high seas area. Um, and it's also a bipartisan is uh, issue in the United States. Congress passed a joint resolution that President George W. Bush signed into law calling for this same approach. So as someone trying to represent the United States internationally, this is a great and unusual benefit. <laughs> right. And yes, I do actually think we are getting pretty close. Um, as Scott outlined, after a number of years of uh, 
laying the groundwork for this, the five countries whose exclusive economic zones border that area, U.S., Russia, Canada, Denmark, Greenland, and Norway, uh, got together in Nuke Greenland and agreed in principle <coughs> to do just that. We will not allow our own vessels <coughs> to fish in this area until there's a proper management scheme in place based on proper science. And we will also jointly pursue scientific research related to fisheries, of, uh, potential fisheries in that area. Um, and, and this is important, we did agree, including Russia, that other states other states have legitimate interests in this and need to be brought into the discussion. Why? None of the five coastal states here or in any other part of the world have exclusive jurisdiction over fisheries beyond 200 miles. That's what the law of the sea says, whether you're a party to the convention or not. Uh, we, the coastal states, cannot do this on our own. The most we can do is say what the rules are for our own vessels who might someday want to fish there, and set in motion a process uh, that would involve the other states. Now, the nuke meeting happened shortly before problems in Ukraine and Crimea arose. But at least from where I sit, there oughtn't to be all that much relationship between the two sets of events. We have already agreed in principle on a way forward. Uh, the five governments are still thinking about um, reducing to writing the uh, understandings that were reached in Nuke in a kind of non-binding declaration. I'm still hopeful that we'll be able to do so sometime in the near future. And then, more importantly, invite the other, what we would call in the fisheries world, distant water fishing nations, other states who might uh, wish to send vessels to fish in this area, particularly the area that is uncovered now, as you see in that picture, and get them into a real negotiation about this. It could not be a fait accompli. We can't tell them what the result should be, but we could at least organize the five coastal states into a point of view and hope to impress upon the others the wisdom of our perspective. So I... Um, I re I'm actually pretty hopeful that this will move forward. It is not an, um, being done under the auspices of the Arctic Council, that has to be clear, um, for at least a couple of reasons. Some of the states that we wish to engage in this are not in the Arctic Council, except perhaps as observers. And a couple of the EU states that are members of the Arctic Council, Sweden and Finland, don't have fisheries management authority. They've turned it over to the EU, which is not a member of the Arctic Council. So this is being done in parallel, if you will, or it's a, an exercise that's moving forward uh, in awareness of what the Arctic Council does with respect to oceans, but not as an Arctic Council initiative as such. Which brings me to what the Arctic Council is doing on oceans and what it might do in the future. Um, there is a lot of work that the Arctic Council is doing. There's an Arctic Ocean Assessment that was recently completed, quite a lot of other work. I have often wondered, and this thought occurred to me last week as I sat in Secretary Kerry's Oceans Conference, uh, what of the various ideas being advanced there might be profitably pursued in the Arctic. Um, it is an emerging ocean. It is an emerging ocean in some very real ways, uh, not only because of the re reduced ice cover, but because of what we're learning about it and because the growth of human activity of many kinds has already begun is likely to continue. Uh, one thing that is done in some other parts of the world that has not yet been done here is um, a kind of regional seas program. There are a number of different types of these around the world. It's an effort by states to join together to deal with common problems, both within 200 miles and beyond. The United States is involved in two such programs, one in the Caribbean region, the Caribbean Environment Program, set up by the Cartagena Convention many years ago. A series of protocols to that were also party to. Uh, and in the Central Pacific, South Pacific area, what used to be called SPREP, uh, we're involved in that as well. Many of the other Arctic states are involved in two others in the peripheral regions of the Arctic. One is the Oslo-Paris arrangement, known as OSPAR. Some of you may know about that. And then for the Baltic Sea, there is the Helsinki Commission, HELCOM. 
Um, and a lot of very good coordinated uh, work goes on through those. Uh, and it, uh, I've often wondered, would it make sense to uh, take that kind of model and uh, adapt it in some way uh, to the Arctic region? Is it time to do that? How, and there are a lot of interesting questions about that. How would such a structure relate to the existing Arctic Council and the good work that is being done on some of those same topics through some of the Arctic Council working groups, PAME, CAF, et cetera? But uh, it is not a crazy idea. Uh, here in the United States, we have taken significant steps forward in the last several years to become better stewards of ocean space under our own jurisdiction. Uh, the, this administration uh, promulgated the National Ocean Policy, which does include um, the uh, Arctic area as well. Um, specific to the Arctic, we have a national strategy for the Arctic region. David Hayes mentioned an, uh, another sort of related exercise in integrated Arctic management that has both terrestrial and marine components to it. Um, we are trying to do the right thing to manage competing uses uh, and for, for my purposes, I'm thinking about in the offshore area, no, no mean feat. Uh, can we build out what we're doing? Can we learn from the other Arctic nations uh, more than we already are about how they are grappling with some of the very same uh, problems in their areas? Can we continue to reach clearer understandings about what ecosystem-based management means at an international level and actually apply it in useful ways. Uh, the U.S. chairmanship could be a time to find some grounding, some, some advancement in these issues. There are uh, quite a few of us who work on oceans issues who would like to see that. Um, we'll see. It's, a, I'd say, a profitable ground for moving forward. Oceans, by their nature, are international. Uh, and here we have an emerging ocean in the middle of a fascinating region, most of the region, as Lawson pointed out, is ocean, perhaps we can be doing more than we're currently doing to manage it. Thank you. Thank you, David, very much. Um, I'm, I think we should move to open to questions fairly quickly because we got a little bit of a late start, not too late, but uh, we've certainly got time for questions. Um, if I might, I, I would like to say uh, I think the panelists have have introduced a lot of very interesting ideas that are uh, fodder for a very good discussion. First, the idea that there might be a way for the Arctic coastal states to work together to uh, put in place, in a sense, a management regime ahead of any industrial fishing in the Central Arctic. Um, to some extent, as I understand it, the, this idea has some grounding in U.S. policy enacted with the help of Senator Ted Stevens when he was still in the Senate, in which the uh, the Regional Commission Managing Fisheries in the in the Bering Sea and the Arctic uh, for the U.S. agreed that we don't know enough about fish stocks and fishing conditions and habitat north of the Arctic Circle to manage those fisheries intelligently currently and that we shouldn't open those fisheries until we do. So one question is, perhaps for David, you might have encountered this in your discussions, uh, what kind of science cooperation does it imply that we're interested in if we agree with the other Arctic coastal states that we want to have a better assessment of fisheries and fishery conditions and fishery habitat in the central Arctic before we begin to fish there? Does that imply some commitment to get a better understanding, to work together? Are we already thinking about that? Um, and does that uh, offer some basis on which we could get other nations, including perhaps even distant water fishing nations, to agree to a regime if they understood what condition we we're trying to meet before opening such an area to fishing? Um, there has been fairly extensive work already to try to share 
what scientific information exists uh, among the coastal states and also to reach out to other states uh, on this. There were two scientific workshops already held formally on this and a third one committed to when we were in Nuuk. Uh, there are also marine science bodies for the North Atlantic and North Pacific. Some of you may know about that, the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea and for the North Atlantic and so-called Pisces, uh, North Pacific Marine Science Organization. Uh, there was an understanding that we would use or try to work through those bodies as well uh, to build out what we do know about this. One other point, though, is what we know is not nearly enough yet. Um, the scientists will tell you that mostly we don't really know what's going on inside that red area, at least not enough to base um, management of some fishery today, commercial fishery today. Uh, I don't really know what's entailed in finding out enough. Uh, resources are short in all of the countries involved. This is not a high priority area yet for fisheries, and yet we need to find some basic information if we're going to allow properly managed fisheries to start here someday. Great, thank you. Would any of uh, would Scott or Andre, would you like to? follow up on that or any other point before we open it for questions from the audience. Andre, yep. please. Okay. Well, basically, I would agree, but uh, there is a rough understanding on, on where and how we could go. Mm -hmm. Resources is, is an important issue. I believe one point which uh, is consensual is to say that, indeed, so far there is not enough stocks there uh, for any commercial fishing. We don't know when it's going to appear there, which way, which source, and there are, of course, uh, also many different developments uh, in the ocean as such, and this needs to be subject of uh, research. Uh, but I would emphasize that we do have a very uh, productive uh, cooperation between Russia and the U.S. Uh, on the Bering Sea, northern yeah. part of the Bering Sea, uh, which uh, is supposed by experts in Russia who are engaged in this, which is supposed to be a good model for uh, uh, going ahead also in the, in the Central Arctic, uh, or not only Central Arctic Ocean, but for going beyond uh, the Bering Sea. Uh, part of this uh, research is, uh, well, it's joint research. It's research uh, ships uh, of both sides working in each other's economic uh, area very productively. It's very much appreciated by, by the Russian scientific organizations which are engaged. And uh, it was very much, very much structured along uh, developing a data, common database uh, on the uh, biological stocks uh, in, the, in the Bering Sea. Uh, and uh, at least what I know from the Russian uh, people who are engaged in this uh, process, they believe that uh, we could have avoided the problem with the Bering Sea central uh, uh, hole mm. uh, if we had systematic research before. Mm. Uh, they would see that one of the problems with the Bering Sea was lack of systematic research, which we don't have yet now. And the proposed idea is that we extend this cooperation first to the Chukchi Sea and may take this as a model for a scientific cooperation on the central basin of the Arctic Ocean, whoever is engaged in this sort of scientific uh, cooperation, including developing a database which would allow us to have a systematic collection of data and monitoring and assessment of the fish stock evolution in that, in the biological resources in general, evolution in that area. And I'll just um, emphatically agree with the two of those, just with a slight addition, um, the two previous speakers. I think the, um, the, the uh, this agreement can be used both before and after it's, if it's eventually uh, signed. Um, as a launching pad for more systematic uh, research and cooperation in this area. Uh, the U.S. and Russia have a long history of bilateral cooperation in the Bering, uh, Bering Sea, and it would be very easy to extend that to the north and the Chukchi. And it's about, and from my point of view, it's about um, kind of traditional fishery stock assessments. So, for example, Nobody has any idea what the biomass of Arctic cod is, the most essential forage species in this region. But in addition, it should also be um, uh, looking into uh, ecological interactions 
And so not just focusing just on fish stocks, but really looking at how those fisheries resources play a role in the ecosystem because um, there's, uh, there's still much more to learn about how this region in the Central Arctic Ocean is used for migrations of really important marine mammals that are uh, important to the environment and also still provide important sustenance for indigenous folks that hunt them in Greenland, Canada, Alaska, and Russia. So there's, uh, and there's seabird interactions with Arctic cod that are just really important to understand. We barely understand them in some of the coastal waters where it's much easier to re uh, do the research. So there's a lot of unanswered questions here. I feel like it's an opportunity to, um, to essentially double down and figure out how to do that. And then Brooks, you raised a really good point, which is, um, using uh, the same opportunity with non-Arctic countries. So I think there's a lot of fruitful avenues here to pursue. Great. Can, let's go to the audience and see if there's or to all you folks. Hang on. Uh, I saw Lawson's hand first, and then I saw Khan, and then I saw... But uh, Yeah, I mean, isn't this topic uh, ripe for the Arctic Council if it chooses to jump into fisheries? It's not necessarily fisheries management. The Arctic Council is known for assessments, and, and maybe uh, and the Arctic Council has some non-Arctic state observers who are distant water fisheries interest. And I also, I'm always nervous about the five Arctic coastal states doing their own thing. I understand the legal ramifications here. But if you do it in the Arctic Council, I mean, Iceland has potential for distant water fisheries in, in the Arctic. You know, maybe not Finland and Sweden, but 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 they'd probably play, we'd probably get consensus to do it, to do an assessment of uh, and, and outline all of the questions and assimilate and assemble all of what you just said. And, and maybe it's been done before, but I'm not persuaded because I hear all the questions. And, and, and the Arctic Council is good at identifying all the key questions. In fact, the, one of the latest studies is about acidification. I think there's compelling evidence that acidification is going to diminish the potential for fisheries and the ecosystems in the Arctic and, and in the, just outside the Arctic. So my guess is that, I mean, is it feasible that the United States and the other Arctic states might tackle this particular subject within the structure of the Arctic Council? Thanks, Lawson. Uh, Khan, would you like to? And then I saw, yes, Kelly. Thank you. Um, Dr. Zagorski, you referred earlier to the uh, agreement, the fisheries agreement between Norway and Russia, and I'm wondering if uh, you could summarize the lessons learned um, that, that have been learned through that agreement, and what are the binational means you have uh, for scientific assessment, for uh, uh, joint decision making, what have you, and are those lessons applicable to the larger Arctic community? I think we had uh, Kelly Faulkner. Do you have a, you have, is that one working? Okay, good. So my question goes we'll to. We'll bundle and then we'll come back to Khan's question. Yeah. Goes to, um, the safety of fishing vessels. <laughs> I think the polar code does not apply to the fishing world, so I just would like a, dis a brief discussion of that issue as we're looking ahead. So first to Andre to talk about lessons from Norwegian-Russian cooperation in fisheries management, and then to David or anyone who would like to comment on the application of the polar code to the fishing, fishing world. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, Russia-Norway cooperation on fisheries is uh, already a long-term experience, uh, beginning particularly with the uh, agreements which had been signed in 1975, 1976, 1977, and establishing a special mechanism for uh, working together, uh, and uh, those mechanisms being expanded. Uh, let me say there have, are several lessons which I may spontaneously uh, think of uh, to, to be drawn from there. Well, first of all, <coughs> uh, there is a very, very specific situation, uh, although not unique there, 
Because if we talk about uh, straddling fish stocks in the Barents Sea particularly, uh, we identify these stocks as common stocks. So we cannot divide the Barents Sea into an area, into the Russian economic zone where we would fish and the Norwegian economic zone where Norwegians would fish for a very simple reason that fish in terms of ages and matureness is distributed unevenly. We have uh, young fish in the eastern part, in the Russian economic zone, and mature fish in the Norwegian economic zone, and the uh, rep reproduction areas, particularly in, uh, around the Lafoten Islands uh, in, in Norwegian waters. So if we want to keep this stock intact, uh, we hmm. shall share our fishing uh, uh, quarters uh, within the area uh, in the best way in order to preserve the stock and, and uh, get it reproduced. So th this is... Uh, the basic rationale for many years of Russian-Norwegian cooperation, uh, which is very much embedded into the existing uh, regional fisheries management organizations, not only regional fisheries management organization, but also if I look at the ICAS, which is a hundred years old scientific cooperation body of countries involved in this area, uh, which, produces, which produces a very solid uh, research evidence or scientific evidence of the stock development, uh, we have a very effective, or at least it is uh, uh, seen as a very effective NIAFC framework for managing the stocks uh, in the area, including in the Russian-Norwegian uh, uh, fishing uh, uh, grounds. And we do have a very elaborate uh, bilateral mechanism for uh, uh, working together, which includes both common research, it includes defi defining the quotas, uh, and it particularly includes looking after uh, an effective reproduction of the resources. So the effectiveness of both the bilateral Russian-Norwegian mechanism and of NIAFC in general is based in Russia at least on the solid record uh, of maintaining uh, a sustainable fishing uh, in, that, uh, in, the, in that area. Uh, so defining a common stock, I think, is a unique and but not no, is, is an important but not a unique uh, uh, experience which we did. Uh, and uh, despite of all the difficulties, we, because we also may look at the problems which we have with Norway, one of them uh, different standards for uh, for scientific fishing. So Russian law requires that you uh, dispose of the whole scientific cage without bringing it to land. Norwegian laws require uh, that you bring everything on land. Uh, so we, uh, this, this was a, a stumbling block in Russian Norwegian cooperation in, in common research uh, in that area. But of course, the whole cooperation is based on common research. So sometimes now our researchers would go on board of Norwegian ships uh, for common research purposes and, and uh, participate in the Norwegian expeditions. So there are all these problems, but the, exactly defining the stock of some fishes as common stock is, is a solid guarantee that we work together in order to have a sustainable uh, fishing uh, arrangement. Uh, so it's, it's very advanced. It's very advanced in every sense, also on the research side. Well, if, uh, I, if I understood your remarks correctly, I think you get to a very interesting issue that I had wanted to raise, so thank you, which is we talked at the beginning about what kinds of positive cooperation might be possible in not only the area of fishery management and the area of, of um, management of the marine environment. And I think the linkage that you just talked about uh, is an area that is worth exploring, and I was wondering if David or Scott might like to comment on it, and that is the link between fisheries management and ecosystem-based management of the marine environment. Because I, as I heard you, you were saying that you can't just manage the stock as, was, as if it was an undifferentiated stock across a boundary. It's, you have to actually manage it with attention to its, the ecological aspects of its usage of the ecosystem on either side, which are not identical. If the young fish are in one location and the fisheries reproductive zone are in another, you have to manage with attention to that difference. And uh, to me, that's a very interesting question because it gets to the question of how we might use concepts like ecosystem-based management to achieve better coordination and management of the marine environment. So if anyone would like to come back on that, I'd be very interested. 
we're not yet that far with origins. Uh, what we have is a very, very traditional sort of no. defining the quotas and uh, sharing the quotas. Uh, also, it, it went much further in um, seeking to the extent possible to establish the same rules right. of fishing, uh, uh, et cetera, but not yet in terms of integrated management of the uh, sea areas. Uh, we are approaching this because the regions have introduced an integrated plan uh, for, the, for the Norwegian part of the Barents Sea. We are moving towards this, uh, harmonizing it to the extent possible with the Norwegian rules, and by the end of next year, uh, the Joint Commission is supposed to present uh, uh, the first plan, draft plan for the Russian government uh, to address the issue. But so far it was not an integrated way. And I would say that uh, uh, we, Norv Norwegian and Russian fishers do understand each other very well. But we do uh, see many challenges coming from the economic development, both on the Norwegian side and on the Russian side because uh, it is particularly some of the most productive areas, uh, biological productive areas, which are targeted uh, for, for uh, offshore uh, exploration and um, uh, mining. Uh, for a long time, we did, as long as we did not have any, uh, any maritime boundary uh, mm -hmm. in the economic zones, any exploration was prohibited in the, in the contested area. So now we do have uh, the maritime boundary and uh, there is an expanding, particularly on the Norwegian side, a very, very extensive development. And uh, if we look at the most recent huge debate in Norway concerning whether or not licenses can be sold around the Lafoten Islands, which, which is a reproduction area for, for the uh, Barents uh, Sea Cod, uh, so far the fishers in Norway have won the battle, but uh, even the integrated uh, management plan on the Norwegian side was not very helpful. And so uh, I, this is... Uh, the way we need to move towards, as I was mentioning at the previous panel, but we are not yet there, and not yet met that here in the bilateral Russian-Norwegian cooperation. Great, thank you. David, did you have a thought on this? <laughs> I was thinking instead of trying to answer questions posed by Lawson and Kelly, is that all right? Please, um, feel free. So Lawson suggested that perhaps the Arctic Council can contribute to the fisheries related issues, and yes, perhaps they can. Uh, I think we can agree that the council will never become a fisheries management organization, right? Can't do that. Um, uh, but uh, perhaps through came, PAME or CAF or others, there could be work, further work done, and say, uh, by the council on uh, assessing fish stocks and other parts of the ecosystem related to the question of when and how and what fisheries might look like someday in the future. Uh, Kelly asked a question about the coverage of uh, fishing vessels in the Polar Code. So I'm not an expert on this, Kelly, but my understanding, there may be others in the room who know better, is that the problem isn't with the Polar Code, it's with the underlying IMO conventions to start with, SOLAS, Safe the Life at Sea Convention, and uh, MARPOL, that in the way that they cover fishing vessels, which say not very much at all, and there are long historic reasons for that, uh, probably not specific to the Arctic. Um, what I can say is if fishing vessels are to be going up anywhere into the Arctic, they should have to meet the same basic types of standards that we're building into the Polar Code, right? We don't want them any more than we want tankers or cruise ships or any other the covered vessels to, to run into problems there. How we achieve that, I don't know. Sorry, I don't know. It's my understanding that the Polar Code is supposed to cover fishing vessels uh, and pleasure vessels at the next stage, not at the stage we're discussing for the time being. Well, thanks, right. But we also need to be clear that uh, fishing vessels are responsible for 50% of the pollution so far. So it's about 50% mm -hmm. of the traffic uh, and pollution there. So it's, it's going to be an issue even after we have the first wave of the Polar Code there. Well, in according to the agenda, we still have a few minutes for questions if there are further questions. I don't want to, uh, yeah, John. Yes, I have a question related to the rationale for some of the mo motivations for these treaties. And that is that I've heard from a number of places there's not enough information upon which to base a fishery. We don't know the science. In the U.S., 
the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council closed off commercial fishing five years ago. So it would be very interesting to know, okay, now five years have passed. What have the regulators asked for in terms of the knowledge they would need if they were to open a fishery? And what has NOAA NIMS actually done in terms of doing research to address that? My sense is, and I'd like to be disabused of this, that precious little has been done, and it seems to be, and I hate to use the word red herring here, but um, I'll use chicken and egg instead. When you ask NOAA NIMS, gee, why don't you do research north of the Bering Strait to say, well, you know, we only have so much money. Uh, motivation is to do it where there is fishing, which is in the Bering and the Gulf of Alaska. So we don't have money to do fish trawls where there is no commercial fishing pressure right now. So we get in this chicken and egg. We're not going to get the science until there's a real pull demand from industry to do that. So disabuse me of my sense of this. Do you, uh, Scott, do you want to come back on that, or does someone else want to take that one on? Is the, uh, is it, is the demand for better science a red herring or not? Uh, no, it's not a red herring. Uh, <laughs> but John, some of what you say certainly is so. Uh, the resources available to do fishery science are not infinite. Um, uh, fisheries in other parts of the U.S. EZF or Alaska are some of the most important fisheries, in fact, are the most important fisheries the United States has. And uh, yeah, if I'm allocating a fishery science budget within NOAA, I'm going to put it where there is great importance. That is to say nothing's going on. There, there have been, um, there has been some research going on in the area uh, right along the coast. Um, but the specific question you're asking, what are the managers of potential future fisheries in this area asking, and what are they getting back from the scientists, I don't really know. That would be a good question to pose to our colleagues at NOAA. Mr. Um, of course, you're raising a really good question, and you essentially answered it when you posed it, um, so it's, I won't argue with you. But when you read the uh, U.S. Arctic FMP, you know, it didn't base it on, we don't have enough information to make a good decision here. It actually took the best available information it had, which were some, some very preliminary stock assessments for three species and essentially concluded that they, um, there was not a, um, a cert, essentially an ecosystem surplus for Arctic cod. So if Arctic cod, saffron cod were going to be the most likely um, targeted species, they actually did a really nice job of then looking at what do we know about the ecosystem implications of targeting Arctic cod and concluded that basically it's everything we know shows us that it, it, there isn't a huge commercially available surplus because uh, so many other parts of the ocean rely on Arctic cod. So I actually think they, you know, they did a really credible job. Clearly, you read between the lines, there's tons more that we need to know. Um, and I could, I, you know, I'm, I confronted with this every day. But, um, but I think, you know, the notion of best available science is really kind of one of the answers. And, uh, and I still go back to the last notion that I actually think um, we can bring attention to this area with an agreement that says, okay, let's, let's not start fishing uh, as a way, as a platform for uh, additional and extra re uh, integrated research. Thanks. Well, I think you might all agree. Very good job of opening up some of the complex issues associated with managing the living resource systems in the Arctic. And uh, this is certainly a real world example where some choices do need to be made and uh, they'll have interesting implications and uh, not just for the Arctic coastal states, but also for how, how we talk to non-Arctic states that are, let's say, evincing a new interest in the Arctic uh, in this area. And, uh, but I just want to hope you'll join me and thank the panel for their, for their very intelligent discussion of this. All right. Pleasure. And one more panel to go. We're going to just change uh, the set here for a very quick panel change. If we just take five minutes and then we'll start very promptly at four. Oh, no, you did a good job. Very good job. Thank you.